continue our study in the better covenant. Many times in the book of Hebrews, as I said, God has established a better covenant through Jesus Christ. But it's not only that. I want you to notice two significant verses in Hebrews chapter 8 this evening. First of all, it says in Hebrews 8 and verse 7. It's very important to read these verses with an open mind and heart. When we read the scriptures, if you come to it with a preconceived opinion, unwilling to change your preconceived ideas, you'll never get anything from scripture. One of the things I decided very early in my Christian life was that if I ever found anything in scripture that contradicted some cherished truth I had held for many years, I would give it up. After a careful study of scripture, if I found a truth, I would follow it, whether it was popular, accepted or not. And that's what's lifted me from one degree of glory continuously to another. For scripture is like a well, and there are many, many new things that God can teach us if we are faithful to what he has already shown us and if we come to it with an open mind. Hebrews 8, 7, If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. What does that teach us? The plain, simple truth is that the first covenant was faulty. I wouldn't dare to say that. If scripture hadn't said it. The plain meaning of Hebrews 8, 7 is that the old covenant was faulty. Does God make a covenant that is faulty? Did he have second thoughts? Is the new covenant like some new model of car that is made rectifying the mistakes of the old? Far from it. God never makes any mistake. Then why did he give the law? It was to teach man that you could never come up to my standards no matter how hard you try. It served a purpose. It was faulty in the sense that it could not make anyone perfect. That's what it says earlier on in Romans, uh, sorry, Hebrews 7.19. The law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there's the bringing in of a better hope. So the first covenant was faulty in the sense that it could not accomplish what God actually wanted to do in man. And man needed to understand that. God knew that from the beginning. But it's something like, you know, when a child is doing a mathematics problem at home. And he's struggling and you know he's going on the wrong track. He's taken steps that are wrong in the calculation of that arithmetic problem. And you tell him, son, that's wrong. Let me just show you the right way. And you know how children are stubborn. No, dad, just leave me alone. I know how to do it. What do you do? You say, go ahead. A half an hour later, after trying so many times, he may come to you and say, dad, show me how to do it. That was the purpose of the law. The law was our tutor, our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. But it would only lead to Christ those who had tried to keep the law and could not succeed. In that sense, the law was faulty. Romans 8, 3 says, what the law could not do because of the weakness of the flesh, God accomplished. What was it that the law could not do? The law could not make a man free from sin within. The law could only deliver him from sin on the outside. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, and so on. And because of that threat of punishment, if they violated the law, Israel became a morally upright nation compared to all the other nations of the world. But it never changed the heart of people. Paul himself says, 
In one place he says, I kept the law from childhood, I lived with a good conscience. According to the righteousness of the law, he says in Philippians 3, I am blameless. The same Paul says in Romans 7, But when it came to the last commandment, thou shalt not covet. I found all types of coveting inside my heart. I found all types of lusting. The word coveting is the same as lusting. Thou shalt not lust was the last commandment. Nine of the ten commandments you could keep. They were all external. God put a tenth one in, which is inward, to see how many people would be honest to confess that they could not keep it. The last one was thou shalt not desire thy neighbor's wife or anything that is thy neighbor's, thy neighbor's daughter. Every girl who walks down the street is your neighbor's daughter. Thou shalt not desire. Thou shalt not lust. Paul was honest. He said, I couldn't keep it. I tried. All the external commandments I could keep. But when it came the tenth, I couldn't keep it. And the law could do nothing to a man who was so wholehearted and radical like Paul. The law was faulty. It could not help man. But there were not many who were honest like Paul to acknowledge it. Man is quick to acknowledge sin that's committed on the outside, which other people can see. But very few are honest like Paul to say, Lord, but there's lusting inside. Am I supposed to live with this forever? Paul knew he was not supposed to live with this forever. He cried out, O wretched man, who shall deliver me from this? And then he says, the law of the spirit of life has set me free. Though what the law could not do, God accomplished. Romans 8, 4 says, So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled inside us. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Holy Spirit. That was the primary purpose of the gift of the Holy Spirit. We want to speak today about the Spirit's fullness. The other verse I want to show you is Hebrews 8, 13. When he said, a new covenant... He has made the first covenant obsolete. If the government of Australia, if the parliament of Australia wrote up a new constitution, the first constitution would be obsolete. You'd have to live according to the new constitution. A court of law would uphold the new constitution. You can't do something and say, well, that was right according to the old constitution. The court would say, but we are under a new constitution now. You can't go by the old one. The first is obsolete. That's exactly what God says about the old covenant. How many Christians have understood what it says in Hebrews 8.13, that the first covenant is obsolete, cancelled. And that which has become obsolete is growing old, ready to disappear. They were living in a transition period at that time. But the writer to the Hebrews inspired by the Holy Spirit says, that's finished. That old agreement God made with man is finished. He's not talking about the Old Testament of the Bible. Don't mix up the Old Testament of the Bible with the Old Covenant. The Old Testament is three quarters of our Bible. And uh, there's a tremendous message in it. In fact, one of the reasons I produced that 70 hour CD uh, was to teach this generation that did not value Bible study how there was a message in every single book of the Old Testament for today. So I value the Old Testament greatly but the Old Covenant that God made through Moses is obsolete. We're not under law. We're under grace. Today is the age of the Spirit. Moses went up into the mountain and came down with two tablets of stone. Ten commandments. Jesus went up to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to replace those two tablets of stone. Those two tablets of stone were God's law written on the outside, on rock. It was as it were God was saying to the Israelites, 
It's easier for me to write those commandments on rock than in your hearts. But when the Holy Spirit came, the promise in the Old Testament was, in Ezekiel 36, I will take away this rocky heart of yours, and I'll give you a soft heart. And I'll put my spirit within you. And I will write my laws upon your mind and your heart. How does he write it? If you compare a passage in Matthew chapter 12 with Luke chapter 11, we don't have time to look at it right now, but you can look at it later. In one passage, God's, Jesus said, If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And in the parallel passage, he says, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. When you compare scripture with scripture, you discover that the finger of God is the Spirit of God. It is with the finger of God that he wrote those commandments on the tablets of stone. And it is with the same finger of God, the Holy Spirit, that he writes his laws upon our mind and our heart. Like it says in here in Hebrews 8.10. This is the covenant I will make with them. I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them upon their hearts. This means two things. It means first of all, God gives me a mind, a desire to do his will. He puts his law into my mind so that I say with the psalmist, I delight to do thy will, O God. But the Old Testament people couldn't go beyond that. I long to do your will. But the man who wrote it, when he saw Bathsheba, he didn't do God's will. The ability was not there. He says in Psalm 40, I delight to do thy will. Many a Christian is living right there. I believe many of you sitting here, you have a tremendous delight to do God's will. But in the moment of temptation, you can't do it. That's exactly where David was under the old covenant. And if you don't believe that the old covenant is obsolete, you will live under that old covenant forever. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. When Jesus said that in John 8, 32, the Jews said, what do you mean free? We're already free. That's what a lot of Christians say today. We're free. We're not going to hell. And Jesus replied to the Jews, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. That's the freedom I was talking about. And I believe that is the word that Jesus would speak to many a Christian today. You think you're free? Whoever commits sin is the slave of sin. And if the Son of God shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus has sent the Spirit, first of all, to set us free from sin. You can't do it on your own. Fifteen hundred years under the law proved that they couldn't do it. Paul, who was a man who kept the law from childhood, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he couldn't do it. It's no use wasting our time trying. You cannot make it. But if the Son of God, if you allow Him to do it in your life, He'll free you from the inside. You won't just get a reputation for being a kind, good person on the outside. Sin, you'll be free from sin inside. That is the message of the new covenant. What the law could not do. The law could not deal with sin inside. God did. Now the righteousness of the law can be fulfilled inside us. This is the primary purpose of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not surprised that the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is the doctrine which has caused maximum controversy and division in Christendom today. Do you think the devil is stupid not to do that? Of course. He's smart. He knows that this Holy Spirit is the thing that will make, that will set Christians on fire. That will be the, make Christians a threat to his kingdom. So what does he do? 
He divides Christians into two extremes. One who have gone on to a fanatical, gone off on a tangent of fanatical extreme and counterfeiting the gifts of the Holy Spirit with psychological gimmicks and emotionalism and calling it the Holy Spirit and doing all types of things which, like Paul says to the Corinthians, if somebody came into your church, they'll say you're mad. That's exactly what we see. And then he's got a whole lot of other Christians who react against this and go to the other extreme and say, we don't want the Holy Spirit at all. The devil's happy with both. He doesn't, he doesn't care which edge of the cliff you fall over, so long as you hit bottoms. But there is a narrow path between these two extremes. And that's the path we see in Scripture. Jesus, as I said earlier, was given to man by God as an example, a forerunner. Let us look unto Jesus and run this race. I remember I was young, when I was a young Christian, I was in an assembly where quite honestly, though we studied the scriptures and all, I could not honestly look up to any of the leaders of that assembly as godly, spirit-filled men. But I never opened my mouth and criticized. I was a young person and God told me to shut my mouth. But what the Lord told me was, if you don't find a human example to follow, look at me. And very early in my life, Christian life, I learned the secret of the Christian life was looking unto Jesus. Not criticizing men. It's not my business. God is their judge. But if I didn't find a man worthy enough as an example to follow, I would look at Jesus. And I saw in Jesus the perfect example of the spirit-filled man. And I said, Lord, this is what I want to be. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that I can be like Jesus. So that I can preach like Him. So that I can live like Him. So that I can serve the Father like He did. We don't have to be turned off by the extremes that people have gone to today. With the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to be turned off from the teaching of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Just because some people have taken it to a fanatical extreme. The other day I asked you this question. What is the first promise in the New Testament? And I mentioned it in Matthew 121. He shall save his people from their sins. Do you know what's the second promise in the New Testament? Matthew 3, verse 11. He shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And I want to say to you, I'm not talking about the counterfeit fire we see in many large sections of Christendom today. I'm not talking about emotionalism. I'm not talking about unchristlike practices. I'm talking about the genuine fire of God. We read in the book of Leviticus that when the fire of God fell, the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, tried to duplicate that. And God smote them. And today we see the same thing happening in Christendom. There is genuine fire here and there. But the vast majority are trying to work it up. And God hates it. And the result is many sincere Christians are being turned away from seeking God for the power of the Holy Spirit and the fire of God in their life because they've seen the counterfeits. I remember as a young Christian, I was born again, I was baptized, I was studying the scriptures. But I felt there was something missing in my life. And people tried to convince me theologically, oh yeah, you got everything when you were born again. I tried to believe that. I went to an assembly that taught that. But when I read in the scriptures, words like this. John 7, 37 to 39. If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. This he spake about the Holy Spirit. Who was not yet given. For Jesus was not yet glorified. 
but whom those who believe in him would receive. And I said, Lord, whatever people may say, rivers of living water are certainly not flowing out from my life. I know that. I find what's flowing out from my life is trickles. And that also with great effort. In many parts of India, where there's not enough water, they set up a hand pump with a bore well. And people have to struggle, 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 and pump and pump and pump. And if there's not enough